All right, so you all might get a Google Meets might yell at you real quick that we're recording. And that's that. So thank you for coming today. Today we are working on how to prioritize limited time and energy for educators. It is a pretty big topic. And this one hour, I'm gonna be honest with you, probably not gonna be enough to really move the dial. The real work is gonna come after all of this. But before we get too far, I want to lay down just a couple of ground rules for us. Please feel free to interrupt me at any time. I only built in two opportunities for question and answer where I'm gonna stop. Other than that, I'm just gonna keep going and assume you don't have any questions. So feel free to unmute yourself, interrupt me, or use the raise hand feature. I'm gonna do my best to keep an eye on if anybody has a raised hand, but if I don't get to you, please just interrupt me and I will answer any questions. You can use the chat to throw in questions as well, or if you just wanna send an emoji, or I'm gonna ask you maybe to throw some stuff in there from your own experience. And that way we can kind of tailor this a little bit to what you wanna hear instead of just me getting up here and chatting. Uh, feel free to keep your camera off. Uh, I am not a stickler for having your camera on. If you're more comfortable with it off, please feel free. It does not make a difference to me. Uh, and I do not have any handouts for this, Avishan, but um, if you have anything at the end of this training, I will have a exit survey where if you would like to um, request some kind of handout or something that is related to what we talk about today, I'm more than happy to make something up for you. The reason I'm asking if, if I have to take notes or anything like that for my use. Yeah, I would definitely encourage you to take some notes. And what I'll kind of talk about in a little bit too is that not everything in here might be super relevant or helpful for you. So please take what's helpful for you and reject what you don't need. You don't need to fill your plate with more stuff. That's why we're here. It's hard enough already. We have enough going on already. We don't need to add more to our plates. Okay, and I'm gonna also invite you to practice avoiding distractions. If you're a serial multitasker like myself, this is a good time to practice drawing your attention towards the thing that we're supposed to be doing right now, which is learning how to prioritize our time and energy. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about eliminating, eliminating distractions and avoiding distractions. And I wanna see if you can notice a, a difference in how some of these might play out for you later. So who am I? My name's Jake, I am a social worker and I've been working for the last 10 years in the Colorado public education system, mostly in alternative education settings. So working with uh, students with high social emotional needs, um, working with students who have been expelled or are at risk of expulsion. And I'm also the co-founder of an alternative school for students who are expelled. And that is where I currently work now in my school district. In my free time, like to play in a band. I like to play video games. Most notably, I've been playing uh, the latest Zelda uh, Tears of the Kingdom game on the Nintendo Switch, which if you haven't played it, if you've never played a Zelda game, that series is fantastic. So definitely recommend it. And I love walking my dog. The second I get off this call with all of you, that is what I'm gonna be going to do. He's been waiting for it all day. And then you can see this is just obviously my super cute dog. He deserves to be in every slide, but I just put him on the one. So why am I here today? I wanna help educators achieve and maintain a healthy life-work balance. It's something that is really hard to do and something that to some degree is not necessarily encouraged. And there's kind of a, a culture in education where having a life-work balance is not always possible or easy to achieve. And we're often told maybe that's not what we should do. We should take on more and make school our priority. And I want to try to break through that, not today, but every single day after for everyone in education. So that's why I'm here today to try to help you not burn yourself out because that's really what led me to start doing this training in the first place it was because i burned myself out so hard i thought i was just going to have to leave education i did quit my job at one of the schools that i was working at at the time and really had to do some soul searching of like is this something that i really want to keep doing because at the time i was working incredible hours as i'm sure most of us are and i just i couldn't do it anymore i started having nightmares about my work which 
did not prompt me to want to sleep very much. And ultimately I had to leave my job. I do not want that for any of you. I, at this point now, that was about six years ago. I've been able to do a lot to kind of turn things around, recover from that burnout. But as you all know, not everybody can do that. Once we get to that point, we start losing a lot of really high quality educators to the demands of this job. And I believe that that is not necessarily for a good reason. So why am I here today? Because I wanna give you the tools to be able to avoid burning yourself out and make working in education fun, enjoyable, and sustainable. And the way that we're gonna do this today is I've broken up what we're doing into two parts. Part one, we're gonna work on some mindset stuff. In order to be successful with some of these changes that I'm gonna encourage us to make and some of these tools I'm gonna to offer us, we really gotta lay a solid foundation of having a good mindset walking into this. Part two, we're gonna get into some specific tools and exercises that we can use ourselves to be able to better prioritize our time and our energy and make our work as a whole more sustainable. And to be clear, these tools and exercises, I've designed it specifically so that it's not gonna cost any money. You don't have to go out and buy anything. You don't have to sign up for software. You don't have to do anything like that. And it's gonna apply to all types of work, all types of roles, whatever projects you have going on or the ideas you wanna to try to get to or whatever your goals are, this can apply to anybody. If you're the secretary answering a million phone calls a day, I think that this is gonna help you. If you're a teacher, trying to teach 150 kids, I think this can help you. If you're a counselor or a social worker working on a managing a massive caseload that we all have these days, I think this can help you. What we're really gonna do today is work on understanding the mindset shifts necessary to be able to more effectively manage our time and energy because a lot of what I see is the mindsets that we adopt in the field of education aren't the things that we aren't the, the things that are necessarily going to help us be in this career for the long run. So I want to try to shift some of that today and challenge some of our more traditional thinking. I want us to discover the tools and exercises we can put into practice the moment that you leave this training. So tomorrow can be a better day than it was today and so on and so on. And we also need to get real about some of the personal factors that are holding us back that impact our energy levels, our motivation, and how we can kind of start to plan accordingly because we can't have high motivation all the time, but we can plan for when our motivation is low to still be able to perform at a high quality level of work that I know that everyone here really wants to have in their work. And I wanna talk about getting more done specifically without adding more to our plate. The things that I wanna show you today are gonna to help you be able to get all the things that you wanna get done without trying to add more and more and more. And we'll talk about a little bit more about that in a minute. What we aren't gonna do is I'm not gonna be able to give you a magic trick to give you more time, energy, or motivation. It's just, it's not possible. A lot of this work that I'm gonna talk about today does require some extra energy. It's hard work and and that kind of sucks sometimes. Getting to the point of being able to have a healthy life work balance, being able to get to the point where we feel like we have enough time and we can get all of our work done, we gotta make some changes and that's hard work. So I'm not gonna be able to give you an easy way out. I apologize in advance, but if you wanna do this work with me, I am here for you and I will support you every step of the way. We're also not gonna be able to learn how to accomplish more with less energy. It's just not possible. We can adjust our energy levels in the way that we switch from task to task, or rather how we don't switch from task to task, how we can maintain our focus so that for a given task, we spend less energy, but I'm not gonna be able to make anything easier or have us be you know, super energized at the end of the day. Cause I'll tell you what, I worked today and just got home and I am a little tired and that's just comes with the territory. I'm also not gonna be able to help you figure out what you should be spending your time on. Only you know what you need to spend the time on. I'm gonna more focus today on the how and some of the tools you can use to get what you want done. Because every school is different, every professional is different, and we need to 
not try to put ourselves in a box. So part one is mindset. If we aren't mentally primed to use the tools in part two, they're just not gonna be effective for us. And keep in mind, like I said, this one hour training might not be enough to move the needle very far. You're gonna get some tools that you can implement today, tomorrow, the next day, but the real work of taking control of our time and our energy starts after this training. So first I wanna start with some common personal narratives that really hold us back. Things that I hear a lot and that I too have said myself and still say today is I'm not good at time management, I'm not good at being productive or I'm terrible at planning or I'm a type B person and everything is just a mess. I can't possibly get myself organized. Speaking as someone who really identifies with the Instagram reels of the type A teacher who walks into their room and everything's in its place and everything's meticulously planned and cleaned. And then the type B teacher who walks into their classroom, spills their drink and spills their drink all over the pile of papers that they have on their desk. That, that is me. I'm the one with the messy desk and the cluttered brain that can't quite get everything focused. But yeah, and Avishan, you and I are very much alike in that way. And so, but these tools, these are skills. We can learn to be more productive. We can learn to be more organized. We can learn to plan more effectively. And our time management skills are a skill. And for a, a really long time, I honestly didn't really believe a lot of that. So trying to undo some of that like stuckness of believing that we are not good at something or that we can't be good at something, that's really one, what I want us to move past today because this is something that we can get better at. And the biggest thing comes down to in order to see a change in ourselves and in our work, we need to commit to changing the way we see ourselves. We need to be able to accept that doing some of this work of learning how to be more productive, prioritize our time and energy, and still provide a high quality of work, that's gonna take an impact on our self-identity of you know someone who maybe believes that they're not good at planning or they're not good at organizing. We need to break through that and understand that some of this does come down to our own self-image and being able to accept that changing that is really hard, but I believe in all of you. And on the subject of change, there's really two types of change that I want you to start thinking about. The first one that I want us to focus on today is radical change. And I'm putting this up against what I'm calling reckless change. And so to start, reckless change is full speed ahead. We think in the short term and we're just really focused on getting things and getting results now, immediately, crossing things off of our to-do list. It has an inherent lack of clarity when we engage in reckless change because we are trying to go full speed ahead, because we are just trying to get things accomplished and get things crossed off. We end up not necessarily knowing where it is we're trying to get to, or even why we're trying to cross these things off of our list. Oftentimes, reckless change creates more problems than solutions, because if we're going full speed ahead, we're not sure where we're heading, or maybe we have so much happening. You know, I've worked in a building where it was just chaos all day, every day, emergency after emergency after emergency. And then by the end of the day, I really wasn't sure what I accomplished. And so trying to engage with change in an environment like that often leads us to reckless change and more problems that it's worth. And honestly, it's pretty unsustainable to engage with change in this kind of way. When we think about radical change, I want all of us to think of our favorite English teacher, our favorite language arts teacher. Maybe it's one that you had as a student, maybe it's one you have in your building now. They are the champions of radical change. And here's why. Radical change, you have to think in the long term. You can't think in the short term 
only. You have to include a bigger picture of where you want to get to, right? Mr. Blegan, or, oh, sorry, Miss Blegan was yours. Yeah, she is a champion of radical change. Radical change is methodical, reflective, and iterative. And here's why English teachers are the unsung champions of radical change. Have you ever turned a paper in or an essay in as the, as the first draft? They don't like that. Why? Because they want you to be methodical. They want you to reflect on what it is that you've written in your first draft, and they want you to iterate on it, and they want you to think, how can you make this better? This first draft may be pretty good, but how can you make it better? How can we attack this again to think for the long term of how do we create a really, really good product at the end? And for us, when we're thinking about how do we manage our time and our energy more effectively, it's an iterative process. Because the second we leave this training today, we need to start being able to reflect on are the practices that I have right now and are the habits that I have as it relates to my time and energy, are they serving me in the way that they need to? Radical change also spans multiple disciplines, areas, mindsets, values, skills, everybody. For this, think about an initiative that you brought to your school or somebody brought to your school doesn't have even have to be something that you liked but just something that initiative needed to span across all the academic departments it needed to span across all the peripheral departments the counseling special education in down to who's answering the phones at the front desk when we engage with radical change in ourselves or in our schools we have to balance so much to be able to get it all in harmony. It, that's why it takes a long time. It's not easy. And when we think about reckless change, we're just gunning it. We're going for it. We're just trying to get results and make it happen. A lot of times, reckless change is trying to take a five-year initiative and put it into five months. I've seen that happen multiple times. And when we're thinking about doing that for ourselves, think about trying to get the new habit of going to the gym. I am someone who has tried and failed to get on a effective gym routine multiple times because I like to believe that I can just wake up tomorrow and be a gym rat and just be totally, yeah, same Margie. Like It's so difficult and it's so alluring to want to engage in that type of change because imagining ourselves as a different person can be really easy that process needs to be iterative. We can't just do it all at once. And radical change is the result of compounding efforts. It happens over time and we can't just focus on one little tiny change or one really big change. Both are important, but we need to think about the results of these changes over time. And I think for me, when I was in my first school, I was really, really good at just showing up and taking on whatever it was that my day threw at me. At the time, I was on the crisis response team for our school. It was a school for students who have social and emotional disabilities. And so my job was whenever anybody became dysregulated, I responded and helped get them to a point where they could come into the classroom. In my job, I didn't have to do a whole lot of planning, to be honest with you. I just went whenever my radio rang, I went there and that was my entire day. When I shifted into more of a role as a case manager, I really started to th think about, wow, I've spent so much time not having to plan, not having to manage my time, not having to manage multiple students on my caseload that I'm not even sure where to start. Now, five years later into that journey, I have it pretty under control. But if you look at how I do my work now, it's totally different than how I did year one of my job. And I think that's the same for all of us. And that's because of these compounding efforts that we need to engage in. And like I said, radical change changes our relationships with ourselves and our work. It does impact our self-image. The way that I see myself today and the way that I see my work totally different than two years ago 
five years ago than 10 years ago when I first started in education. And that is kind of a scary thought to think about changing the way we see ourselves. But that's the work we need to do. And there are a couple of myths about productivity and time management that I want to address before we get too far. This process is not passive. You can't get more done with less energy, and you can't walk away from today having the skills to be able to manage your time more effectively. I'm sorry if that's what you showed up to hoping for. I apologize in advance, but I will help you get the foundation to understand the work that needs to happen tomorrow and the next day. But this requires a lot of work. The hard work starts as soon as we all get off the computer here. I want to be super clear about this. Learning to be more productive and effectively manage your time is not a way to add more to your plate. Some people, I'll be honest with you, some people see it that way, and some people might try to use it that way. And that's not what I want to do today. I do not want to try to teach you these skills so that you can accomplish more or do more. I want you to be able to get the stuff done that needs to get done. And I want you to be able to take care of yourself in the process and still have time and energy left for the rest of your life. I don't want to figure out how to cram even more onto your plate because that's not helpful for anyone. And there's another myth about productivity that in order to be productive, we need to be busy all the time. And as we'll talk a little bit about when we bring up how to take effective breaks, that's just simply not the case. In fact, it's quite the opposite. So I want to start thinking about time. A lot of time I hear that as educators, we don't have enough time to get everything done. And that's true. There's too much to do, too little time. If I only had more time, maybe I would be able to get this done. And I want to try to shift our thinking on this just a little bit. No matter how we slice it, whether we believe we have too little time or if we believe we have too much of it, all of us have the same amount of time, same amount of hours in the day. And as far as contracts go, same amount of time that we should be working. Obviously, that looks a lot different for a lot of people in education. But no matter how we slice it, we have the same amount of time. So what I'm proposing is that instead of taking a time-based approach to the things that we're doing, I want us to take a task-centered mindset and a task-centered approach to evaluating how we utilize our time and energy. And what I mean by that is if we have the same amount of time, then that implies that we can only get a limited number of tasks done. So instead of evaluating when we have something new come up, how am I going to fit this into my already limited time that I don't have enough of? I want us to start thinking about, does this task fit into the time that I already have? Is this task going to be a good use of my limited time and energy? Because if it's not, we need to figure out how to get rid of it. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And we also need to think about our mental energy and our focus. So um, recognizing our own energy levels is super key to being able to be more productive. And Having intentional planning that we'll talk about in a little bit is a way that we can conserve our energy because I'm someone who does my very best to, to not show up to work without a plan of what I'm going to get started with and what I'm going to do for the day. Because to me, if I show up and I'm not sure what I'm going to work on, I'm going to be just spinning my wheels, spending a ton of energy trying to figure it out right, for, right off the bat. And I'll tell you what, if I don't have a plan for how I'm going to spend my time, someone else will. Whether that be my students, whether that be my colleagues, if I don't know how I'm going to spend my time, 
they will tell me how I should spend my time. Just like when I was on the crisis intervention team, my students told me exactly how I was using my time that day. And these days I can't afford to do that. Obviously emergencies come up, but it was pretty mentally exhausting trying to figure out what I was gonna be doing every day without actually uh, knowing what I was gonna do in advance. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in part two when we talk about tools and exercises we can use. And we also need to consider our own motivation levels. Like I said at the beginning, they change. They're all over the place. Just because I may be like nine out of 10 on the, on the motivation scale today, tomorrow, I could be a four. We need to plan ahead for that because at the end of the day, some of our work is mission critical and we just got to figure out how to get it done anyways. Planning can help us get there and, can, and figuring out how to conserve and manage our mental energy and focus can help us get there. And same with brain power. If we don't have a good sense of where our brain power is at, we might be spending even more mental energy trying to accomplish a task that requires more brain power than we have in the moment. I find this kind of towards the end of the day, I start to really try to focus in on tasks that, excuse me, I should have done earlier in the day because they require a lot fresher of a mind. And after I've been using my brain all day, sitting down at a task at three or four o'clock to try to bust it out when it requires some really complex thinking, probably not the best time for me. And I wanna talk about this concept called attention residue. As we're thinking about how to conserve and manage our mental uh, energy and our focus. This, was, this term was first introduced in 2009 by Sophie Leroy in her research on attention and focus, specifically, what happens when we start to switch from one task to the next? And what she found was that switching from one task to the next leaves a mental residue or some attention residue as she coined it that prevents us from fully engaging in the current task at hand. So what does this look like? If I'm working on, let's just say, what did I have to do today? Today I was working on adding my portion of the team agenda into our team meeting notes for today. And granted, it wasn't much, but if in the middle of that, I go and I hear a ding from my email, and then I check my email, and now something came up there, and now I'm thinking about that, but then I now have to switch back to finishing putting all the agenda items in to the meeting agenda, I still have that mental residue, that attention residue, where I'm, I'm now I'm thinking about that email too. Now my brain is split between trying to prioritize between do I finish this agenda or do I check that email and respond to that? And I am someone who has fallen victim to this quite a bit. And I can tell you what, that's when we really start to get that brain fog that there's just so much going on, I couldn't possibly focus on any one thing because there's so many things to focus on. So as we're moving through some of the tools and practices, I want you to think about attention residue in your work. Are you engaging in just one thing, giving it your full attention, getting it done, crossing off, crossing it off your to-do list? Or are you trying to bounce around to multiple things, letting yourself be distracted, stretching your mental energy to more and more things? And then now, Whatever you focus on, you can't because you have 10 other things kind of processing in the background here. This also starts to introduce the concept of shallow work versus deep work. And this comes from the book Deep Work by Cal Newport. If you haven't read it, I recommend um, if you are into like self-help productivity books like I am, go for it. If not, I'm going to give you the basics real quick. The radical change that we want to see in ourselves and in our work requires us to strike a balance between shallow work and deep work. And now, right off the bat, you might be thinking that shallow work is automatically bad, but it's not. So what is shallow work and what is deep work? Shallow work is the things that we have to do that may not move the needle any farther in what we're actually producing as an educator, as a teacher, as a counselor, as an administrator, whatever it is that we have to get done, the shallow work 
isn't necessarily going to move the dial very far, but it is necessary. And I'll explain why in a second. Deep work is where we dump all of our creative juices, what our brains are good at, coming up with really good ideas and creating things. That is where deep work comes in. And deep work requires a longer amount of time for us to focus and be focused and hone in on one thing. We can't be falling into the attention residue trap when we're in deep work because we need all of our focus focused on one thing. So some examples. In my school, we just recently rolled out a suicide prevention program called Signs of Suicide. I spearheaded this project and this implementation. So what I really needed to do was go through all of the materials provided by the Signs of Suicide company, synthesize how that was going to work in our building, figure out a plan for how we were going to deliver it to our students, how we were going to respond to their needs, both during and after this presentation, and then how we were going to actually structure the day around this. And there was a lot of stuff that I had to go through in terms of materials to prepare for this. All of that required a lot of mental energy and a lot of focus for me to be able to like fully understand what the curriculum was for this program, be able to fully understand how I wanted to deliver it to our students and fully understand how I could present this to the team in a way that they would understand as well when they were helping me implement this. That was the deep work part. And I needed to close myself off for a longer period of time than I would normally like to, just so that I could get this done. Because it was a lot to hold in my head and make sense of, where if I was getting interrupted, that deep work concentration is broken. This deep work is also associated with that flow state that you've probably heard about in artists, in high performing CEOs. Um, but it happens in all of us. We can all get into this flow state. And that, it, that flow state where we're producing our best work, where musicians are just playing their best song, where Jerry Garcia is just ripping through the best solo he's ever played. That's that flow state. That's that deep work. And we need to be able to access that to perform at our highest level. On the flip side, there was shallow work that also came with implementing this curriculum. And that shallow work was a lot of data documentation, filling out forms, making sure I was printing things off, um, making sure that I was setting things up in the room, but also like sending notifications home to families, stuff that on the surface doesn't really take a whole lot of brain power, but takes time and energy. And some of those things can be done on the fly, you know, like getting a, a communication sent out. Most of it was already templated up for me. So I just had to make some quick edits and send it out. Pretty shallow work. I didn't have to block off a lot of time for that. But the balancing the two of these in our work is really, really difficult. And one way that I can kind of explain this to you, the difference between the two is shallow work is like watching a TikTok video, watching an Instagram reel, or even just watching a couple of YouTube videos to learn how to fix something on your car, change a tire, change your oil, watch one video, you'll probably be okay. If you want to learn and understand how a car works or how anything works, the deep work is like taking a college level course or a trade school level course, or earning a full degree. So where we can learn and do simple, easy things with a TikTok video or just one YouTube video, we can't nearly get the quality and expertise that we can that with a deep work level of a college class or a college degree. And so in your mind, I want you to think about some things that you have in your work that might be classified as shallow work, it might be classified as deep work. Like I said, a lot of data entry is shallow work. Sometimes phone calls are shallow work, but I've had a couple, a couple phone calls this week already that felt like deep work to me. But uh, where deep work might be presenting a new presentation or building a curriculum or 
implementing some kind of initiative across your entire school. And so when we're, when we're thinking about how do we avoid this attention residue, we really need to figure out, am I doing shallow work that can be easily interrupted? Or am I doing deep work that requires me to maybe shut myself away more than I'm used to and really just focus? And this brings me to breaks and rest. And I think that there is a lot of power in taking breaks and in the way that we take breaks. And in schools in general, I think we have a pretty unhealthy culture around being busy all the time and not having enough time to sit down and eat your lunch. And I think that there are very real reasons why this happens. There's a lot to do. There's a lot to get done. There's a lot of people that need our time and attention. And there's a lot of students that we're trying to take care of. But taking breaks and taking rests is essential to being able to show up day after day. And it's also essential for engaging in this deep work that we need to do. Because if all we're doing is shallow work, we're not really moving the, the needle towards what we need. And deep work requires our brains and our bodies to be rested and well taken care of. And so there was a study done by a tech company that honestly, I don't know what they do, but they studied their most productive employees. And what they found is really, really interesting when it comes to breaks and rest. They found that their most effective and most productive employees took on average 17 minutes of breaks for every 52 minutes of work that they did. And that's, if you do the math, that's about 25%. They found sometimes up to 30% of their most, most productive employees' time was spent taking a break. And now, I know the reality. We can't figure out how to work in 17 minutes of break every 52 minutes in a school. Sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. Some people have to teach for four or five classes before they get a prep period or even a chance to use the bathroom. Some people don't get a chance to use the bathroom at all. So I'm not saying we should really hold to this and that we can just casually spend 25% of our day just lounging. But I do think that this gives us a really interesting perspective into the power of breaks and the power of rest in our work. Because when we're trying to accomplish something really grand and really impressive and really profound in our schools, which honestly, I believe we do every single day in education. There's a lot of processing that happens in our brains in the background. And that's what breaks provide us. If we just take everything at face value and try to just run full speed ahead, engage in that reckless change, then we're not giving ourselves time to stop, take a step back, and really think about, is this what I want to spend my time on? And I think that's where one of the biggest things um, that taking a break is helpful for. And how we take breaks is so super, super important. The most important thing about an effective break is that it doesn't add more to your to-do list or your mental load. Has anyone here ever said they were gonna take a break and then check their email? Absolutely. Yeah, that's not an effective break. <laughs> because what happens when we do that now our brain is thinking about work again. We're not actually taking a break. We're thinking about all those other emails that we're seeing and we're not really letting ourselves rest. We're not, yep, even in vacation, same. I have tried really, really hard this year to not look at my email on any breaks, to not answer my, I have a work cell phone, I don't answer it at all on breaks, nights or weekends. It's really, really hard, really hard, especially during the day and I see a lot of us, myself included, if I'm resting, but somebody else has a classroom full of bananas kids, why do I get to deserve to rest right now when they have to be in the thick of it? That's why it can be super, super difficult to take an effective break. 
And so I really want you to think about when you leave here today, what is an effective break for you? For me, when I'm at home, and an effective break for me is grabbing my guitar and just playing something random, not really learning anything new, not really playing anything specific, just playing. When I'm at work, an effective break is sitting down and eating my lunch for once. And sometimes I have to actually close my computer, close my door, and force myself, as guilty as I feel that I'm taking a break, letting myself do it anyways. Yeah, and Jada brings up uh, something that, that I actually relate to, was taking smoke breaks. Or, or at least just calling them smoke breaks too. I mean, I remember this is, education is not the only place that has this problem. When I worked at McDonald's, there was a clear defi divide between the people who took regular breaks and the people who didn't. And I can tell you who did and who didn't. It came down to who smoked. Those of us at the time who smoked, we went out and smoked a cigarette break religiously. Those Those that didn't, they didn't really take a break. Maybe they'd go putz around for five minutes. But I think the interesting thing about that is you have to give yourself a plan. You have to give yourself something to hold on to as this is your break. And I am looking at the clock. I am running a little behind. So I'm going to kind of speed things up real quick. This is my time that I built in to pause. Any thoughts or questions so far? I guess I just want to add that guilt part because um, you talked about taking a break, real break, but when you are in the midst of everything, taking a break doesn't mean anything because you're being either spread too thin or you actually need it somewhere else. Exactly. It's hard. It's not easy. And there might be a lot of pushback from people in your building who might judge the crap out of you. I just saw on a Facebook group that I'm a part of that somebody got a parent complaint sent to the administrator because during their lunch hour, a parent saw a teacher sleeping in their classroom. During their lunch hour, they had no duty. They weren't supposed to be doing anything, but the parent submitted a formal complaint and you know used the the same old reason everybody does everything in education. I'm paying your tax dollars and this is how they're being used. Whoop you do. That's what we're up against. It's real. I'm not going to say that that's going to go away just because we decide, oh, I think I need to take a break. That guilt is real. And right now, we got to figure out how to work through that and change education. Okay, another question. Let me see. That's a really good that's a really good question. So the question is what are suggestions for when administrators add a lot more to our plates and tries to push our boundaries for breaks or too much workload. And I think that the one unfortunate answer is that it's kind of outside of the scope of just today because that's happening everywhere. I think that the most important thing that we can do is to not be pushed around. People are gonna push back on your boundaries 100% of the time. That's why they're there. People are gonna push back on it. And as much as it sucks, as uncomfortable as it is, we need to be courageous and we need to be strong in how we advocate for ourselves and establish those boundaries. And I know that that is not a very concrete or clear or helpful answer. <laughs> so let me get back to you on that because at one training that I'm working on is all around boundaries. And I would love to share that with you kind of moving forward. So I think that there is a section coming up in part two uh, for today talking about saying no. And I can give you um, maybe one or two pointers on just simply saying no that might be helpful for you. Any final thoughts or questions before I move on? All right, perfect. I'll, I will remind me um, at the end, I'll send out a survey. If you could just add that in the survey, I would really appreciate it so I can follow up with you.
Yeah, saying no, we all could use that more, which is why we're going to talk about it today. All right, so part two, tools and exercises. Again, these tools and exercises cost zero dollars. Don't need anything to start. And here's the thing. We as professionals already know what to do. Today, I want to walk you through how we can improve doing it. The things that we need to get done might not change, but the way in which we do these things makes a difference. The first tool on my list is what I believe to be one of the most underrated and underutilized tools that we have, especially in the modern digital age, and that is pen and paper. I personally carry around two notebooks with me everywhere I go, and this is my entire professional life right here, these two. One thing that I really like about using pen and paper is that this thing can't scroll the internet, it can't get notifications from Facebook, it can't lure me into an ad talking about seven tips for losing that annoying belly fat. This is just a piece of paper. It's whatever I make it. I can organize my thoughts. I can organize my plans, my projects, my time. The uses are unlimited. And it's distraction-free. That's what I like most about it. Because I, for a while, I thought I was a complete, like, total, digital, everything... I'm going to use an iPad to take notes. I'm going to take everything on my computer. All my calendars and reminders are going to be on my computer. And I did that for a while. But what you fall into is that a computer, a phone, an iPad, tablet, whatever you're using, a digital tool of any kind, it is designed to pull your attention in as many different directions and hold your attention in those directions that might not have anything to do with what you're actually trying to get done. Every time I would go to log in to my notes app, I would get a notification about an email or I'd get a notification about a meeting that's coming up. And thinking about that attention residue, now my attention is split and I can't remember exactly what it is that I wanted to do on the computer in the first place. Why did I open up my reminders app? I, I don't know. I can't remember because I saw a million other things on my computer that are now drawing my attention away. I saw a million other things I need to get done. This helps eliminate those distractions because it's all it is. It's only what you make of it. It's not trying to get your attention anymore. It's not being controlled by Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk trying to get you on their platforms to stay as long as they possibly can. It just is pen and paper. And I think it's the most beautifully underutilized tool that we have. But I, I do have a warning, though. Blank pages are extremely dangerous, in my opinion. In order to cut down on unlimited possibilities, because a blank page is unlimited possibilities, I prefer using outlines and templates. This specific notebook is designed in a way where every day has a spot where I can put my to-do list, I can put my three things that I need to get done for the day, and then any other notes that fall in here. I really like the structure of that. Then this other, my other notebook, I can't show you any of the pages that I've written on because there's some stuff that I can't share on the internet, but there is my blank pages. This one is the dangerous one. I carry this one around everywhere with me, but if I really want to be serious about getting stuff done and keeping myself organized, I use one with a template. No, you know yourself best, but staring at a blank page for me is overwhelming. I don't know where to start. But outlines and templates provide us momentum and traction. Now we're going to talk a little bit about eliminating distractions because we have a lot of them drawing our attention. And we need to figure out how we can live with all of these things. We need our email. We need our meetings. We need requests from others. We have to say yes to some things. 
But at the end of the day, these things can become distractions very, very easily. So let me look. I can't remember if I, I can't remember where I put the slide, so it might come up, but I'm going to explain a couple of things that we can do. Email, notifications, phones. Turn off all of your notifications. And when I say all, I mean all. You don't need your email pinging every time you get an email. You don't need your phone blowing up every time somebody comments on Facebook. You don't need your phone blowing up every time uh, you get a text message. You don't need your phone blowing up or your computer blowing up every time you have a meeting. Granted, that has saved me a couple of times when I get a meeting reminder for a meeting that started five minutes ago and I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> and I'm sure you feel the same way, but eliminating notifications is a game changer. It allows us to really engage in the task at hand and it allows us to not have our attention pulled to our emails. I personally recommend scheduling a specific time where you can check your emails and do nothing else. A lot of us fall into the trap of, oh, well, let me just check my email in case there's something important there. Newsflash, there's always something important in your email. And so now that you've looked at it, now you have to deal with it. Now your attention residue is stuck to your emails and not whatever it was that you can't remember that you were working on. Happens to me all the time. So as we're thinking about all of the different things that go and try to grab our attention, we really need to think about how can we set up our systems? How can we set up our devices? How can we set up our days and our work to have this take as little attention as possible when it doesn't need to? As long as we have a routine of checking our emails in the morning and in the afternoon, if that's what works for you, then great. Stick to that routine and you'll never fall behind on your emails. But if we're checking our emails just in case, then we're going to be tied to whatever our email tells us to do and not what we actually need to be working on. The opposite of distraction is traction. When I saw this quote, I really, really wanted to bring it to you all today because I think there's the assumption that like the opposite of distraction is like attention or focus. And that's true. But thinking about it in terms of traction and getting going on a task, because sometimes starting a task is the hardest part. Thinking about how we can get that traction, it's by not letting ourselves be distracted or have our attention pulled by the notifications from our email, the notifications from our phone, the notifications from whatever, whoever's calling your classroom. I am terrible at answering the phone on purpose. I might see your phone call and straight up ignore it. People do not like that. I'll tell you what, people do not like that I don't answer the phone. Sometimes they call more than once and I don't answer. Because if I'm in the middle of something that really requires my attention, I'm not gonna be good on the phone. I'm not gonna be able to provide whatever they need. And honestly, if you really need to get a hold of me, there's plenty of ways that you can figure it out if it is a true emergency. And now take that with a grain of salt. I know we can't all ignore our phones all the time. There are plenty of times when I break this rule and I answer the phone in the middle of stuff and it just is what it is. Sometimes I can anticipate, you know, what somebody might be needing. But I would encourage you to think about something as simple as an email notification pinging for your attention. Turn that off. You don't need it. Oh, here's that slide. One thing I didn't talk about is making a plan in advance. And if we have a plan for how we're going to spend our time, the distractions are automatically reduced because we know what we want to be working on. So as distractions start to loom over us, we have more power to say no. All right, and here's the part about saying no, Christine. Here's my framework for saying no. I ask myself these questions. Is it relevant? Is it reasonable? And is it required? Sometimes the stuff that I don't think is relevant or reasonable is required, just is what it is sometimes. If it's not any of these three, reject it. 
this is the really hard part. Because like you said, sometimes people don't take no for an answer. But how you say no matters. I think a lot of us, when we try to say no, it kind of sounds like this. Oh, I'd love to, but I have this going. I really got to go talk to so-and-so. This other kid told me that he needed to check in with me, so I'm going to go do that. Or I have all these papers to grade. I just, I'm running out of time. As someone who really wants you to say yes, when they hear that, you're giving them ammunition to be able to turn what you're saying against you and convince you otherwise. Here's how you say no. No. Can't do it. And then you wait. People don't like that. I'll tell you what, people do not like it. They want you to keep talking and tell them why you can't. Don't give them that. Because your reason why, they don't need to know. Of course, when we're talking uh, uh, you know, about just trying to say no to admin, it gets a little bit more complicated than that. I definitely recognize that. This isn't hard and fast. You're not going to be able to do it on your first try. And they might still say, well, I don't care. You're doing it anyways. But one way that you can increase your chances that your no is heard is stop at no. Don't give a reason why you can't. Don't make any excuses. Don't give any reasons. Just say no, can't do it, and then walk away if you can, if it's appropriate. Don't, you know, don't be super rude or mean or anything. And I think the, the frame of mind that I think about this is that being clear is being kind. If I give you a million reasons why I can't do something, it becomes unclear why we're having this conversation. That's not very kind. But if I just say, nope, can't do it. I do this with my friends too. They want to schedule something on a day when I can't do it. I just say no. And sometimes they say, why? So I just can't do it. And then I leave it there. Eventually they'll get the message. They'll go away. This takes some practice. I'll be honest. Another thing that you can do is you can say no without saying no. And so what this can look like is, oh, can you help us? We're rolling out this new initiative and I could really use your help. Hey, love it. Great idea. Talk to me in a month. Talk to me in August when we're getting ready to start the year again. Talk to me after this event happens or after registration happens and I don't have to meet with 300 kids. You've said no but you've also given them a way that they can come and ask you again, which is okay, because maybe you do want to say yes. Maybe it is something that is important. Maybe it is relevant, reasonable, and it's required, but you just can't do it right now. Building some space can allow you to kind of get a, a little bit more leeway with your no, because sometimes you might have to do something anyways, but maybe it just doesn't have to be right now. So talk to me in a month. Super backed up right now. I have a lot of priorities. Can't do it right now, but talk to me in a month, in two months. Talk to me in January. Talk to me in August. Sometimes this doesn't work, but give it a shot. Let me know what you think. And so another thing I want us to, to think about, which you can flip onto somebody else too. You can ask yourself this, but you can also flip this on to the people who are asking you to do stuff. If I say yes to this, what am I saying no to? If I say yes to this task, this project, this request, this commitment, with my limited time and my limited energy, what do I have to say no to in order to accomplish that? This is how I start to prioritize my time and my energy and, and what the tasks that I'm being asked to do or the tasks that I think that I have to do or the projects that I want to accomplish. This is how I start to prioritize those. If I say yes to this, what am I saying no to? And the way you can flip this to somebody else is if somebody asks you to do something and maybe you're not too sure if you can handle this or you know for a fact that you don't have enough time to do this, say, great, I'd love to help. Here's the thing though, I'm gonna have to take something off my plate. So what is what are we cutting? What am I saying no to now? 
What am I taking out of my schedule to be able to replace with this new request? I'll tell you what, a lot of people, if you say this to them the first time, probably not a lot of people have asked them this question. So you, just for having been the first person to confront somebody and stand up to somebody in this way, you might just get a win right there. Because it, I've seen it take some people aback of like, oh, well, you know, I didn't think about that. How about this thing? You're off the hook on that. And then now I need you to do this. Like, great, now I can focus on that thing as long as we're on the same page that I'm not doing that other thing anymore. I wanna recognize that I told you all this would end two minutes ago. If you would like to leave, you are more than welcome to leave. I would just like to send out the um, exit survey real quick, if you don't mind holding with me for just a brief moment. All right, if you need to leave, I just threw it in the chat. It is the exit form for this. I'd love to know what you liked, what you didn't like, what you'd like to see next. And, you know, honestly, if this was helpful, was it not? Did I just ramble too much? Please be honest. You won't hurt my feelings. I got thick skin. Oh, geez. Okay. Says we need permission to do that. So let me try to change that. Okay, go ahead and refresh the page, and it should work for you now. And if somebody... All good now. Cool, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, if you need to leave, please, I don't want to waste your time. I told you we were going to prioritize it, and part of that is starting and ending on time. Just because my presentation is longer than it should be doesn't mean you should have to suffer. If you would like to stick around, I'm going to keep going. If you have it in you to keep going, I'd love to have you. If not, I will continue this to an empty room. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate you being here. And please let me know if there's anything else I can help you with. I am here to support you with this. Okay, getting back on track. If we have somebody making a request of us, we can use this question to try to flip it and put the responsibility back on that other person who's trying to take more of our time and more of our energy to figure out how that's going to happen, how that's going to work. And so, Christine, test that out. See if that helps. Not making any promises. Don't know if it's going to be super effective, but try some of those things out and, and get back to me. Let me know. Um, if you fill out that, that survey for me, then I'll make sure I, I follow up with you with an email. Okay, so now I wanna talk about types of planning, prioritizing and goal setting, because I think we're all familiar with things like SMART goals, and many of us probably teach them to our kids, many of us might even already use them, but I think when we're thinking about prioritization and planning, there's a lot more ways that we can go about keeping ourselves on track that don't necessarily have to do with like a formal writing down a SMART goal or something. Things like to-do lists, vision boards, or calendar, all of these things help us keep at the forefront of our brain what's important and what we should be spending our time and energy on. And so as we're going through, just know that there's more than one way to organize ourselves, more than one way to set our intentions and keep ourselves on track, because these things, when we, Put something on our calendar we then take the our, the mental energy of trying to figure out what we're going to do with that time and we make a decision the hard part comes in with actually figuring out what it is we need to plan or how we need to plan it and one activity that i like to use for planning and for just organizing the mess of thoughts that we might get when it comes to all of the possible things that we might need to do to accomplish something or to carry out a project, implement an initiative in our school, teach a class, even just something like that. I love post-it notes. And I have a little thing that I like to do, which I did to plan this training as well. And 
I call it just post-it note planning, nothing special. The first step, brain dump every single thing that you can think of, every little piece of the puzzle onto its own individual sticky note. I like having a big empty table to just stick them everywhere. So let's see, when I was, um, when I was planning the signs of suicide lesson that I talked about earlier, I did the same activity and I just dumped everything that I thought I would need to get done, everything that mat the materials said I needed to do as a requirement, and then everything I wanted to accomplish as a part of this program and as a part of rolling this out to our students in our school. I wrote everything down, one idea per sticky note. Don't try to fill this thing up. There's a bunch of them and they're pretty cheap. Just go crazy. One idea, one thought, one to-do list, one question per sticky note, as many as you can think of. Step two, start to organize, relate, and rearrange everything you just wrote. Questions can get grouped together. To-do lists can get grouped together. Thoughts, problems, whatever you come up with, people that need to be involved, you can group them by timeliness, you can group them by priority. How, how you group them can kind of start to come naturally as you're going about this activity. And that's why it's helpful to get as many as you can spread out because then you can start picking them up, moving them around and grouping them together in a way that makes sense and in a way that's gonna allow you to start to organize some semblance of how to get this done. Then you need to start distilling. You'll probably end up with a couple of post-it notes that are pretty similar. Pick one or rewrite it so you have one and you can start condensing things. Start drawing bro broad categories of the things. Are there to-do lists that you have? Start making your to-do list and distill that down. What's essential? What do you have time for? And what do you need to get rid of? We can't do it all, all the time. Questions or unknowns or areas where you still need more information. You're going to want to make those clear because those can be potential roadblocks that you have. And if you have post, post-it notes with lots and lots of questions on them, chances are you'll probably need to get those answered sooner rather than later so that you can inform your to-do list a little bit better. And sometimes getting answers to your questions when it comes to project planning or goal setting is going to give you information to help you distill things down even further and get rid of things that aren't relevant. Once you've distilled this down as much as you can, creating a plan of action. I take my post-it notes and that's when I'll open up my notebook or a Google Doc and I'll start creating an outline. This does include an element of distilling again and kind of getting rid of the things that you don't need, but it starts to give you a clear plan of action. And from there, we really want to talk about what is going to be the very next actionable step that I can take to meet my goals. And kind of thinking where we were at with like types of planning, we can apply this activity to all of that. And whether it be like, how do we manage our time? If we have one specific project we want to dump, or what am I trying to accomplish this school year as a big goal? That's what we can use this for. It applies to almost anything. When it comes to prioritization, there's one method of prioritization that I did want to introduce to you briefly, and that's called an Eisenhower matrix. And so what the Eisenhower matrix is, is it looks like this. You go in and you rank your tasks from urgent to not urgent and important and relevant to not important or relevant. Start with the easy one. If it's urgent and important and relevant, we're going to do it now. That's a top priority. If it's not urgent, but it is still important and it's relevant, we need to plan when that is. Coming back to my own notebook, there is a page for every day of the week for the next three months. I will plan it in here. I'll put it in my calculator. If I have something, or not my calculator, my calendar, I will put it in there. If it's not urgent, 
but I need to get to it so that I know for a fact that I will get to it because I have a time scheduled when I'm either going to work on it or when I need to complete it by. If it's not urgent and it's not important or relevant, get rid of it, delete it, or say no. This is also a pretty straightforward one. You can usually figure out when you need to say yes or say no, but sometimes, as we talked about before, saying no can lead to some opposition. The real tricky one here is if something is urgent and it's not important or relevant. Most uh, iterations of the Eisenhower matrix tell you at this step to delegate it. But the reality is for most of us, we can't delegate this work. We can't delegate the things that are urgent and not relevant. Most of us don't even have anybody to delegate things to. So what I would encourage us to do is to rethink the task, rethink the assignment, and reevaluate, is there a way that we can make it important or relevant? Or even rethinking the urgency of it its, itself, like if this is not important or relevant, is it truly urgent? I like this method and this model because it gives a clear and concise grid work to get you started. But most of our work is a lot messier than this. And I don't think a lot of the things we do ends up in uh, one of these four boxes. I also don't think that it takes into account the emotional state or the mental state or our energy levels when it comes to the tasks that we have at hand. Just because something's urgent and important and I know I need to do it now. <laughs> I'm tired, man. I don't want to do it. I just want to sit here and scroll on Facebook or something. So this does not help us get over that motivation hump, but it is at least a good starting point for being able to think through how to prioritize things. So if we're doing something like planning via post-it notes, we can start to prioritize the tasks that we come up with in kind of order of urgency and importance. So one thing we need to consider is when we have low energy and low motivation, sometimes it is what it is, we still have things that we need to get done. So I have a couple of thoughts, a couple of tools, tricks, hacks, exercises, whatever you wanna call them, to at least just give you something in your toolbox to think about when you get into a situation where maybe something is urgent and it is important and relevant, but you just don't have the energy to do it now. The first thing that I like to use, I call just the five minute trick. It's been called many names. I didn't come up with it, but just allow yourself to commit to doing something for five minutes. That's it. Heck, if you need to, make it three minutes. Don't go any less than three, or else you just won't be able to build enough traction with it. Give yourself the commitment to just start that task for five minutes. If it's data entry, I, I'm not a fan of data entry. Like I like working with spreadsheets and stuff, but I only like it once the data is already in. <laughs> Getting the data in sucks no matter my energy level. What I do to get over that is just allow myself to do it for five minutes, force myself if I have to. And then at the end of that five minutes, I will allow myself to stop if I can no longer bear that task. And so something interesting happens here. Sometimes we start that task for five minutes and then we don't even realize that five minutes is up because now we've been working on it for 30 minutes and we just got that momentum, we got ourselves started and now we're, we're nearing the end of the task and we're like, oh, well, might as well just do an extra 10 minutes and get it done. It's a weird psychological trick that we kind of have to play on ourselves of just like, I'll do it for five minutes, and at the end of that five minutes, I will allow myself to stop. And that's part of the trick, too. You do really have to allow yourself to stop if you can no longer handle that task. And there's been plenty of times where I'll start something, like entering things into a spreadsheet or um, checking my email and just trying to crank through that, where after five minutes, I'm just like, wow, I feel worse than before I started this this task, so I will stop. Of course, I understand not everything we can just 
choose to stop working on and move to something else. But if you have something where you have the option to give yourself a little bit of flexibility, the five minute trick is helpful. Engaging in a low energy task or low brain power tasks when you're feeling at your worst is also a good trick. This can look like for some people, data entry is super easy to just get started and just go through, like I said, not so much for me, but something like cleaning or organizing your workspace, making sure your desk is nice and clear, picking up after students or something, you know, every single one, yeah, cleaning is super helpful. Just getting yourself to do something that is somewhat productive, even if it isn't necessarily a high priority. Like I would argue that kind of organizing my desk and cleaning doesn't really like move the needle of what I need to get done in the day, but it does help me kind of get back on track and get into a place where I feel like, oh, I just accomplished something. Maybe I can do something else. Or maybe you have a list of, um, in, in my school district, we have to document phone calls that we have with families uh, in our, in our uh, computer system. So sometimes I end up with a long list of things I just need to do because I didn't have a time to put it in in the moment. Maybe I can do that right now. It's a pretty low brain power thing if I took notes. I can just plug them in, get it done. I think the key here is knowing when you have that low ener energy and motivation and then already having a list of tasks maybe that you've written in one of your notebooks or your to-do lists that are specific for the, these times when you have low energy. And the last thing that's really helpful is having an accountability partner. This is a difficult one because finding the right accountability partner can be quite difficult, I'll be honest with you. And utilizing an accountability partner in a way that actually gets you to be more productive is really hard. It's a skill that I'm working on, to be honest, and I'd like to, to kind of bring this up again in a, at a different time. But having an accountability partner is something that can be project specific, it can be task specific, um, but it can also just be, you know, a work, a uh, work friend who you know they're going to help hold you accountable. The problem for me is me and my ac accountability partners always just end up chatting about things that aren't work, and then neither of us get anything done. So <laughs> that's the skill that I'm working on building. But if you have a big project that you know is coming up, find somebody that you know you can check in with, or that you know you have shared deadlines for things that are going to just motivate you. Just that just that little extra bit to get you across the finish line if that's what you need, especially when your motivation might be really sagging and you just need that that extra little bit. Uh, we are coming close to the end here. I just wanna check and see where we're at. Okay, we are almost there. So bear with me. There's two more things that I wanna talk to you about. Sh start up, yeah, start up, and shut down routines. I almost said shut up routines. <laughs> but start up routines and shut down routines. These are essential to for a couple of reasons. For a startup routine, we want to consider this as a way to avoid starting our day in chaos. I am someone who, if left unchecked, I will start every day in chaos, and that chaos will carry on for the rest of my day. Having a clear startup routine allows me to have an intentional start to my morning and therefore an intentional rest of my day where I know what I'm gonna spend my time on. Same with a shutdown routine. My shutdown routine allows me to catch all the loose ends that I might have missed during the, the very real chaos that happens every day and then make a plan for being able to um, come in and have an effective shutdown routine. Yeah, examples. So here we go. The first thing that I do when I'm thinking about either of these, they're pretty interchangeable and most of the time they look pretty similar, but I review all of my to-do lists. For me, that exists in multiple different places. My two notebooks, my calendar, my emails, any other random notes people put on my desk, I need to review all of those and I need to compile them. And I need them to I need to take them and distill them down into something that I can actually read, reference, and then act on. And so that can look like I actually rewrite my to-do list multiple times. 
throughout the day, throughout the week, whatever it is. So just because I write something down once doesn't mean that's its final resting place. I do compile my to-do list multiple times in a day sometimes. And that is to keep myself on track. And it sounds like extra work because it is, but that extra work allows me to stay even more focused when I'm just like not quite sure what to do. And if I have to go look through multiple notebooks and my calendar and my emails to figure out what it is I have to do, I'm just wasting time. So reviewing my to-do list, getting them all in one place. I like to do a brain dump. This usually happens in the morning of just anything that's on my mind, anything that I'm like, oh, I need to get this done, I need to get this done, I need to get this done, so on, so on, so on. Just getting that and capturing that is incredibly powerful. And in the words of David Allen, who wrote a book called Getting Things Done, he says, your mind is for having ideas, not for holding them. And too often, I think we try to use our brain to hold on to our ideas, hold on to our to-do lists, when we really just need to get those things out, start our day by getting all those things. Maybe we started thinking about things on our drive to work. Maybe we're sitting in, in our classroom, in our office, wherever we're at, getting anxious about all the things we need to get done, but we don't write any of them down. Big no-no. We need to actually write them down, get them into a place where if we get bonked on the head, totally forget what we have to do for the day, we can look back to that list and still be successful. Then we need to organize and set up that brain dump because sometimes it can be kind of messy. And so what that looks like for me in my notebook that I use, like I said, it's got a spot for, I don't know if you how well you can see this, but my three most important tasks for the day and then any other tasks that come up. I need to organize what my priorities are. I can only have three priorities in this notebook because if I have, if everything's a priority, then nothing's a priority. Set yourself up. I have been experimenting a little bit with time blocking, which is specifically planning out in your day when you're gonna do a task. No matter how big, no matter how small. If I know that I have to call a parent, I'm gonna schedule a specific time to do that. I'll be honest, I don't, I haven't experimented with it enough to to let you know how it's going yet, but later when I get a little bit more experience with it, I can test it out. And I'm sure some of you probably already do this already to some degree, but trying to take that to the next level in your organization and setup for not only your startup routine, but also your shutdown routine. And part of the shutdown routine is planning ahead for the next day. Part of the start up routine is planning ahead for like how you're going to allow your attention to be utilized in the best way possible for the rest of this day. One thing that I really like to do is I like to create a, to, a do tomorrow list. And this is something that can I, I add to uh, throughout the day, but also during a shutdown routine. I will take all of the things that I need to get done that I know I couldn't possibly accomplish today. And I will put them on my due tomorrow list. And so during my shutdown routine, I will just make a plan for what do I need to get done when I come in tomorrow? One thing that this helps with that's incredibly powerful is being able to leave work at work. If I go home and I start thinking about all the things that I need to do tomorrow, and I don't have them written down in a place that I can trust, I'm going to be super anxious about forgetting something. I probably will forget something. And then by the time I go to sleep, wake up, haven't had my coffee yet, and I'm sitting down at my desk like, what was it that I needed to get done today? It's too late for me. Today, I need to create my to-do list for tomorrow. And that's part of my shutdown routine. And I would encourage you to experiment with that. If there are things you know you need to work on tomorrow, don't wait till tomorrow to write them down. Schedule it today. And in a similar process, one of the last things I want to talk about is a weekly review. And I'm going to go really quickly through this because you all have been super nice to give me an extra half hour of your time, and I don't want to waste it anymore. I really appreciate you hanging in there. But again, if you need to leave, you will not hurt my feelings, but I do really appreciate you sticking around. A weekly review and also considering a weekly preview. So looking at the week that we just had, and looking into the week ahead, there's a specific 
way that I like to do this. And I'm going to go through the, the way that I do this, and then we can talk about why. I want to do another brain dump. As you can tell, I love just getting everything out of my head onto something tangible that I can reference and helps hold me accountable, like the sticky notes, my notebooks, my to-do lists, whatever it is. Brain dump, any loose ends that you had throughout the week, anything you know that's coming up that you need to um, just get on your to-do list and get out there. My recommendation is to start simple. And what I mean by that is this process is kind of hard to prevent yourself from getting distracted. So I always start with things that have the least ability to distract me. So I start by reviewing um, all the things, all my loose ends that are in my notebooks. And once I get all everything I could possibly think of uh, out of the pen and paper and out of my brain, anything that I could possibly reference as a to-do, an event, something I forgot, or something somebody told me that I need to make sure I document. Only once I'm done with my pen and paper tools, then will I access my computer for my brain dump. And then I start looking through my emails. I start looking through my calendar. Is there anything I missed that I need to document right now and make sure I organize? And I like to start simple and work out from there because if I just jump right into my computer, remember what happens? Computers have tons of other things on them that are going to draw our attention away from what we're working on, which right now is our work weekly review. I also want to take this time after I finish my brain dump and I get all my loose ends, I have all my to-dos from the week before that I didn't get done and the week ahead that I need to plan for. I want to go ahead and take a moment to celebrate my success and evaluate my areas of improvement. This is a time to really think about what went well, what do I wanna keep doing into next week? Maybe I did a really good job saying no, or maybe I did a really good job um, organizing my to-do list or keeping a schedule that I set for that day or that week. And then I wanna evaluate areas of improvement for what I wanna to try to do better next week. And I want you to write it down. I will write down sometimes a weekly review. I'll come up with a whole list of things that I want to improve, and it takes up a whole page in my notebook. And then we need to start to put an action plan and plan for the future. If we have things that we evaluate that we want to improve, what's the plan for how we're going to do that? If I didn't do a good job, this happens to me almost every week, if I didn't do a good job sticking to the schedule that I built, how can I adjust the way that I design my schedule to work a little bit better for me? And this is coming back to what we talked about at the beginning with this is an iterative process. This takes a lot of trial and error. And the weekly review is where we really get to laser focus on what changes and what iteration should I come up with next. And as just a little word of caution. We don't want to throw caution to the wind and just be changing things all the time. We want to have a system that we can trust, that we can rely on. So when I'm saying that we need to think about the next iteration, we're not completely throwing out our system. We're just thinking about little tiny tweaks that we can make. And some weeks we might totally kill it, be really, really good. And we don't have to necessarily make very many improvements, but we want to make sure we're watching out for areas where Maybe this week was just an off week for us. Next week will be better. Start planning for the future. Start scheduling out those to-do lists that you got from your brain dump and then figuring out how we're going to go from there. Here's my pro tip for you because you will be tempted to do this. Do not, under any circumstances, within reason, of course, actually finish or accomplish any of the tasks or projects or loose ends that you come up with during the review. That step one brain dump is going to try to pull your attention away to actually trying to do some of those things. For example, if there's an email that in my brain dump and in my just tying up loose ends area where I'm like, oh, oh my gosh, it's Friday. So-and-so emailed me on Monday. I have not gotten to that. Let me just respond to them real quick. Do not do that. You're putting it down. And you're writing it in your to-do list so you can be intentional about your time you can be intentional about the energy. Right now, you deserve to focus on your weekly review. 
You shouldn't be allowing yourself to just run all willy-nilly because that's what gets us to forget things in the first place. We really want to be able to intentionally finish this review, find all of those loose ends, because the second we go and try to answer that email that we forgot about, we're now not in the space to remember our loose ends. We're in the space to answer that email. And then coming back, that attention residue is going to slow us down when it comes to trying to finish our review. The last thing I want you to do, and I, you know, I know this might be a difficult one, but I want you to imagine that you're at your funeral. At the end of the day, all of our work is important. There's not a whole lot that we do in schools that isn't important, right? I think we could all agree with that. But when we get to the point, if you could just be a fly on the wall at your funeral, who's going to be there? And what are they going to say? Are they going to be really happy with all the things that you worked on and all the times you stayed late at school and all the times that maybe you had to go in on the weekends to finish stuff up? Is your principal going to show up and say, wow, I'm really glad that Jake put, uh, put the school first instead of in front of his family? Hopefully not. That would be super weird and rude. <laughs> yeah, they can certainly be grateful that you did that, but let's not bring it up at your funeral. That's not something we want to be proud of, right? When we're thinking about how we're spending our time, think about the long term. Think about the long run. Five, 10, 20 years down the line, is what we're doing today going to be what we're proud of? Is running around in chaos all the time what we're going to be proud of? Or is being very clear about what we're saying yes to and what we're saying no to going to be what matters? Because at the end of the day, this is about more than just what we're doing in our work, but it's how it's impacting our personal lives and our families too. Our jobs are not the only places, place, places where our attention is needed. And taking control of our time and attention really includes prioritizing our own well-being, our own families, and the things that we enjoy to do as a person that's not an educator. If our jobs went away tomorrow, what would we want to be working on? If suddenly no school in the country would hire us, who would we be? Would we be the person who spent all their time at their job and at their work, and now I don't know who I am anymore without this job? I don't want that for you. I want you to live a healthy and fulfilling life outside of your job. And I believe it is possible. Sometimes it is very hard in education. It can be very hard. But I want you to think about at the end of the day, the end of the month, the end of the year, at the end of our lives, what will have mattered? What should we have said yes to? And what should we have said no to? And on that note, I'd like to offer you some next steps. Things that I can offer for next steps is I have a weekly productivity and wellness newsletter specifically for educators where all the stuff we talk about plus so much more. Every week I'm sending out stuff and I send out only good stuff. Once a week, I send you out something that we talked about today. Uh, this last week I talked about the difference between radical change and reckless change and gave you some more in-depth stuff about that that I didn't have the chance to go into today. Talk about things like time blocking, talk about saying no, talk about just how to balance working in a crazy career like education and still wanting to have a personal life that matters. Part of a new project that I'm working on is an educator wellness membership. For those of you who might be interested in that, you can sign up for the wait list. There is an option in the exit survey. Um, and if you already took the survey and you're like, what the heck is this wellness membership? Well, that's what I'm talking about. It includes trainings like this, but that are for the private community. Some of that accountability partner piece is built into that where you get me as your account accountability partner. The wait list is open now, and there are some people who are a part of it, but it's pretty secretive and pretty... Uh, exclusive right now because, well, I need to know if people actually want this or not. So if you're interested in something like this, pretty cheap, $9 a month, and you get access to private recordings of 
sessions like this and more access to talk about, hey, I want to learn about this. Can you run a training on something wellness related like this? Um, like, for example, setting boundaries and saying no to people who do not want to hear no as an answer or will not accept no as an answer. If you're interested, take the exit survey. I'll send it out in a second again. And then it is it is on there. You can check that you're interested or if you'd like some more information. You can also bring me into your school. I will promise uh, not to run over time like I did today. And I offer trainings like this one for free. You can schedule me for your school and I am happy to um, come in, run a PD for a small group, run a PD for your whole school if it's appropriate. You know, I don't wanna waste anybody's time that this isn't important for. Some people don't wanna hear this and that's okay. But if you'd like me to come into your school, just uh, let me know. You can let me know in the exit survey um, or you can shoot me an email. It's hello at jakeruzzi.com. And you can find that on the exit survey as well. It says my email in there. You can also just go to jakeruzzi.com, which is in the uh, bottom corner of the slide right there. I also have some book recommendations that include a lot of the things that we talk about today. So Deep Work by Cal Newport, where we introduce the concept of shallow work and deep work and really getting that time of uninterrupted work when we need it and being able to really focus our brains in a way that allows us to work through really difficult things without being distracted. Feel Good Productivity by Ali Abdal, Real Self-Care by Dr. Pooja Lak Lakshrim. I'm terrible with names and I know I butchered that, so I'm sorry, Dr. L. Getting Things Done by David Allen is a classic book. Uh, I will say with that one, it is um, it's very mechanical in its approach, but the concepts and structures of it are absolutely fantastic. But it is it is pretty mechanical and um, very concrete to get through. And then one that kind of encapsulates this whole idea of really being able to be a high performer in our jobs without burning out and without having to sacrifice our own well-being, The Cure for Burnout by Emily Ballestero. It's a really, really good book. I like the way she frames her approach of, I wanna be a really high performer in my job and I wanna take my job really seriously and do really good work, but I also don't wanna burn out. <laughs> so just some, some ideas for you. Feel free to take a picture. I'll leave it up for another second if you want to um, check those books out or if you'd like me to send you links to get them on Amazon, just let me know. Um, if you forget them, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to recommend a book or two. Thoughts, questions, closing comments? That's all I have for today. You're welcome. You are very welcome. Um, here is the exit survey. There is the QR code. I will go ahead and just bump the... Uh, I think I can pin that message actually to the top. I don't know if that was allows me to, send, I'll just send it again. Here we go. There you go. Yeah, so if you wouldn't mind taking that exit survey, I would really, really appreciate it. It helps me make things like this even better. You know, obviously one thing I need to work on is my timing, but gosh, there's so much stuff that is so important for everybody to learn and, and know about that I went over by 40 minutes. So thank you for sticking around. Um, I'm gonna stick around for another minute if there's any questions uh, or anything you wanna talk about, you know, maybe not as a whole group, I'm happy to make some time. If not, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate uh, your time and allowing me to, to kind of just chat at you for an hour and, and a half. So thank you very much. Yep, thanks Avishan. Okay, and with that, I am stopping presenting, stopping recording.